Good morning, people of God. Good morning. Uh, first, indeed, it is a, a pleasure to have this wonderful opportunity to speak before you. I don't often have the privilege to address a congregation, and I don't take it for granted. Uh, having grown up in the church, uh, having grown up in the Baptist church, I don't take it uh, for granted. Uh, second, I bring you spiritual greetings from my home church, St. James United Methodist Church in Alpharetta, Georgia, where the Reverend Dr. Michael T. McQueen is senior pastor. If you find yourself in Georgia, please come and, and worship with us. You won't find a more welcoming and God-centered church in North Atlanta. And third, and certainly not least, I must thank my good friend, Reverend Lyndon Myers, for the invitation. For those of you who don't know, and those of you who didn't hear Tisha, I met the Myers in the 90s when I was about 11 years old. We attended the same church, and I remember them being the most gracious and pleasant people that I've ever met. And I can say that that is still the case. <laughs> um, it wasn't until last year that we reconnected as I decided to come to Cambridge and attend graduate school. I, I heard all of you in your thunderous applause for my matriculation. I would ask that you convert that into profound prayer. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Some of my cohorts have come to, to join me. Uh, if you don't mind standing up, they need prayer as well. <laughs> oh, I think she's, she's busy. Just, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, so here we are reunited after almost 25 years. It's amazing how God has brought us back together after all of those years. And of course, the reunion starts where it all began in church. I've read all about the, the great things that this man and his family uh, have done uh, for this church and community, and it's truly, it's truly impressive and inspiring. Happy belated 15 years. May you have many more. Uh, please join me in a, a moment of prayer. Father God, we come before you invoking your mighty name and asking that you bless this wonderful occasion of fellowship and celebration of the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Lord, I ask that as I deliver this morning's message, you allow the people here today to see you and not me. Hear your word and not mine. May they learn from the message and apply it to their lives for the edification of your kingdom. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now, before I begin, I must put forth a disclaimer, even more so given the occasion. I graduated from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. What school did Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. attend? Morehouse, Morehouse College. So I've been told that all Morehouse men can preach. Anytime you come from a lauded institution that produces great preachers, among them Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Dr. Otis Moss Jr., among others, there is a, say, a high expectation. <laughs> so in light of my homiletic shortcomings, I will not be preaching today. No, but I will be delivering a message. There's a difference, amen? <laughs> uh, regardless of my oratorical ability or lack thereof, we're going to enjoy ourselves today and learn at the same time. Is that OK? All right. So as I mentioned, this is a homecoming of sorts. I lived seven miles away from here in Boxford, Massachusetts in the 90s, just off of Lawrence Road, which I think turns into Boxford Street, if I remember correctly. Uh, I attended Masconomet High School. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> Uh, there are many fond memories of that. Did someone attend Masconomet? Oh. I think I know you. I saw, I, yeah, I know her from somewhere. Uh, so there are many fond memories of that place, like the time I was a freshman in high school. And I looked down that long corridor, and I saw the most beautiful black girl I've ever seen. I don't recall. I think there was only one, if, if one at all. <laughs> So I was eager to meet her. I was 
said, how did I not know this? I mean, usually I'm in the know. But it turns out I knew her. It was my sister. <laughs> I also remember the time, or I vividly remember, taking Red Sox Hall of Famer Jim Rice's daughter to the prom. I had no clue who he was at the time. I wasn't interested in baseball, I didn't, you know, but that wasn't me. I was all basketball. Uh, when I picked his daughter up at their house, I walked in to meet her parents, and Mr. Rice, a rather large man, greeted me with a baseball bat <laughs> and a few intimidating words. <laughs> all good memories, that just gives you an idea. <laughs> of my experience, uh, but I wouldn't change it one bit. I haven't been back, as I mentioned, for 25 years, and a lot has stayed the same, and, and I appreciate that. But it's long overdue, and how special to be back on this occasion, on the day that, as someone who lives in Atlanta now, is very, very important. To go to work today in Atlanta is to be sacrilegious. In fact, every year I take my sons to Dr. King's childhood home and to the King Center to learn about him, and they love it. As a youngster, you read about leaders like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but you never think that you'll get to meet the people who knew him well. I've had the honor of meeting with Harry Belafonte, the Ambassador Andrew Young, a family friend married my wife and me. I had the honor of knowing Coretta Scott King and paying respects when she died and became the first woman and first black person to lie in honor at Georgia State Capitol. The great and current U.S. Congressman John Lewis is also a friend. I've had the pleasure of working with Reverend Bernice King, Dr. King's youngest daughter. I've even shared an office with Martin Luther King III, <laughs> and so on. So I've read and studied their books and. So living in Atlanta among the civil rights heroes is truly a blessing and quite surreal. I'm reminded of the time I was driving down Andrew Young International Boulevard in downtown Atlanta. I was at a stoplight. I looked to my right, and it's Andrew Young in his car driving on Andrew Young International Boulevard. <laughs> I kid you not. I thought to myself, only in Atlanta could this happen. <laughs> Oh my, so my goal is to bring a little Atlanta to Andover this morning. The definition of legacy. I would like to address you all on the subject of sustaining the legacy. Specifically, how do we sustain the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., undoubtedly one of the most impactful and consequential persons to walk this earth in the last century? Such a question has been asked and answered many times, but I would like to provide my perspective on the somewhat overwhelming question. In doing so, I believe that we must first define what legacy is, second, define what Dr. King's legacy is, third, determine its relevance to our lives, and finally, ask ourselves, as Dr. King's last book did, where do we go from here? So we must start with the question, what is legacy? Legacy, 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 as the famous Jay-Z lyric goes. Perhaps you prefer the artist Eminem. His song says the same phrase. This is my legacy, legacy, legacy. And maybe you're a sports fan. Everyone's talking about what will LeBron James's legacy be if he does not win another championship. Many are talking about what the legacy of Tom Brady will be. Will Alex Cora's legacy be tainted? We entrepreneurs often talk about our legacy. It seems like everyone is concerned with what their legacy will be. Uh, Webster's Dictionary succinctly and simply defines legacy as something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor, or from the past. In other words, a bequest. The word has its etymological origins in medieval Latin. In its basic meaning, a legacy is a gift of money or other personal property that's granted by the terms of a will, often 
a substantial gift that needs to be properly managed. When I read this, I got really excited because it helps me convey to you what came to mind when I was given the subject of sustaining the legacy of Dr. King. The last part of the definition is worth repeating. A legacy is a substantial gift that needs to be properly managed. Hear it? Properly managed. It is my belief that we have mismanaged the gift. The legacy of Dr. King, well, we've got some work for us to do to, to get that right, to change the legacy. Because it's been hijacked, co-opted, extirpated, and so on. And allow me to explain. Many great revolutionary leaders, such as Nelson Mandela and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., have been described as less revolutionary than they really were to satisfy the watered down palate of our society and to bolster an agenda that hopes to quell the true progressive spirit. As I once heard it described, there is a tendency for Santa Clausification of these icons. And it does more harm than good. Eventually the legacy dies or becomes a ludicrous distortion that has little to no meaning. I believe that is what has happened to Dr. King. So the question then becomes, what is the true unadulterated legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? There is another overwhelming and complicated question that uh, depends on who you ask. The popular answer would be to focus on Dr. King's dream. That's the legacy. And that dream describes a world in which blacks and whites and people of all races live together in harmony, as he so eloquently said, in many of his sermons, and eventually at the famous March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. Notice that I said the March on Washington for what? Jobs and Freedom. Jobs and freedom. Not the March on Washington for Dreams. The purpose of that historic march was to advocate for the civil and economic rights of African Americans, but I digress. Yes, the I Have a Dream speech is indeed a part of Dr. King's legacy, but people often forget the other parts of the speech and its purpose. For example, Dr. King mentions the problem of police brutality twice. He says, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Later in the speech, he says, some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. This is one example of these important pieces of his speech that often get overlooked, much like the more challenging parts of his legacy that we tend to ignore. I encourage you all to read the speech carefully, and you'll hear parts of it uh, later. Read it over and over and over, taking note of the many injustices that King mentions that we are still grappling with, still grappling with today. It is more than relevant. It's reality. You and I have to wake up from the dream and continue to make it a reality. Thus, I'll focus on a few parts of Dr. King's vast legacy that tend to get ignored for whatever reason but are just as important to the charge of sustaining the legacy. Yes, Dr. King fought against segregation and then racism. Yes, he fought hard against what he deemed the three evils of racism, materialism, and militarism. These are courageous acts and were all a part of his vast legacy, but I want to focus on those four that I think are just as important, if not important for us today. They are, first, we must live like Christ. Second, we must fight for economic justice. Third, we must free our people. And finally, we must take action now. Live like Christ. The question was once asked, what person or writers most influenced Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
one might say that the writings and teachings of Gandhi had the most profound effect on him. Another might assert that the teachings of the great German theologian Martin Luther himself had a tremendous influence on Dr. King. Still another might offer that the sacrificial life and theological writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer left an indelible impression on Dr. King. The great educator Benjamin Mays might be discussed. However, none of these answers would be correct. The correct answer would be Jesus Christ of Nazareth, followed by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the authors of the Gospels. You see, Dr. King had it right. He dedicated his life to studying and living like Christ. He was immersed in the word. And so we must always be focused on living a life like Christ, doing the things that are consistent with his teachings and in accordance to God's will. In one of my favorite sermons of Dr. King, he jokes about his family's spiritual legacy. He says, of course I was religious. I grew up in the church. My father is a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher. My great grandfather was a preacher. My only brother is a preacher. My daddy's brother is a preacher. So I didn't have much choice. <laughs> and so there's no doubt that he understood the importance of both comprehending the word, but also living the word by serving people. It was in his blood. Dr. King is the quintessential example of one who not only learned the teachings of Jesus Christ through intense and formal study, but also applies them in everyday life to make the world a better place. We are all living the benefits of this legacy of following Christ and focusing on him. If you don't remember anything else from today, remember that Dr. King was first and foremost a follower of Christ. We must fight for economic justice in 2009 when I considered a run for the state legislature in Georgia, I called Andrew Young. And for those of you who don't know who Andrew Young is, he is one of the most important persons in the civil rights movement. Many of the pictures that you will find of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will have Andrew Young in them. In the famous and bleak photograph taken shortly after Dr. King was assassinated, you see Andrew Young on the motel balcony just to the right of Dr. King's prostrate body, pointing in the direction where he thought the bullet came from. Andrew Young, a minister, was executive director of Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC for short. He would later go on to be mayor of Atlanta, US congressman, a UN ambassador during the Carter years for the United States. So when I called Andrew Young on that day about 10 years ago, he was in India at the time with Martin Luther King III commemorating the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's trip to India to pay homage to Gandhi. I told him of my plans to enter politics and to my surprise, he discouraged me from running for office. Perhaps it was a bit of reverse psychology, but his advice was clear. He said, Kevin, we need you to continue being an entrepreneur to garner the resources to more quickly affect change. That advice stuck with me. And even more surprising was what he would tell me a few years later. He commented, if I had to do it all over again, I would become an economist. Yeah. What? <laughs> I was shocked. Not a minister, not a mayor not a congressman, not a UN ambassador, etc. I understood exactly what he meant. There's no true social justice without economic justice. It is clear to me why Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. I've actually confirmed this with those who were in Dr. King's inner circle, ranging from his wife, Coretta Scott King, to Andrew Young himself. Dr. King was killed when his movement began to shift from civil rights to human rights to economic rights. 
or silver rights, as my friend John Hope Bryant likes to say. It wasn't until Dr. King was becoming increasingly powerful, coalescing poor whites and poor blacks to fight for economic rights. Then he became a, an extreme threat. He was ultimately killed when helping sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee to improve wages and poor working conditions. So with this understanding, I am inspired to pursue entrepreneurship to help accomplish Dr. King's goal of economic progress, especially for the poor and downtrodden. More than any one of the facets of Dr. King's legacy, the legacy of economic justice is the one that motivates me to get up every day. We must fight for increased economic opportunity in this country, especially for those who have traditionally been denied access. How do we do that? It's a complicated question. We advocate for financial literacy, better housing, fair and equal pay, humane working conditions, fairly distributed subsidies, reparations to those who have systematically been held back, academic scholarships, and so on. Again, there's no social justice without economic justice. Third, we must liberate our people. In her life-changing book, The New Jim Crow, author Michelle Alexander tells the haunting and worsening situation of mass imprisonment in this country. It is a harrowing book of injustice and out of control systematic oppression. You've probably heard the following unbelievable statistic according to the World Prison Brief, the United States has the largest prison population in the world and the highest per capita incarceration rate. In 2018, the US, in the US, there were 698 people incarcerated per 100,000. This includes the incarceration rate for adults or people tried as adults. And a lot of those are black Americans. Too many of these victims uh, are, too many, excuse me, are victims of systematic, social, and economic oppression. As proven by several studies, many of these individuals don't even have the financial means to defend themselves or even bail themselves out. It's a huge story in Atlanta. Not, uh, folks couldn't bail themselves out for a uh, mere hundred dollars and would stay in jail for weeks on end. As activist Brian Stevenson says, and Brian Stevenson has the, the movie out, uh, what's it called, um, Just Mercy. Uh, as he says, and I like to put it, capital punishment means them without the capital get the punishment. Yet this reality continues to pervade and less people seem to care. Many of us will never see or witness up close the effects of ma mass incarceration or how it affects this country negatively. Our lack of proximity to the condemned makes their humanity that much easier to ignore. How sad, what a tragedy. As Stevenson would say, we all need some measure of unmerited grace. I must admit that I was aware of this problem in our country, a problem tucked away in the rural prisons where no one can hardly see. It didn't touch my life directly until after my book launch in 2013, when I began to receive letters from prisoners whose family members had sent them my book. Or perhaps the prison where they were located had a copy and they felt inspired to write me a letter. It was a connection between my world and theirs. The letters inspired me. Here they were using my story to inspire them to pursue, in many cases, the only path they could pursue once they were released. Their best shot at successfully returning to society and making a living was through entrepreneurship. In fact, some former prisoners have even shared their stories with me of how they started their businesses after prison. In fact, I recently got a message on LinkedIn from one of them saying, I'm doing very well. In the spirit of liberation theology, Dr. King used his Christian beliefs to liberate those who were most in need. We must use his humble example to relate 
to the millions of men and women relegated to an oftentimes cruel and unjust prison system. We must give them hope, dignity, and support to be their best through Christ Jesus. Whether that means starting a prison ministry or dedicating resources to help change this terrible criminal justice system of ours. The Bible says in Matthew 25, 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Amen. Amen. And last, we must take action. And I think this is perhaps the most important part of sustaining the legacy of Dr. King. In today's society, too many of us are engaging on social media instead of engaging in social mobilization. We have become spectators of the gruesome sport of injustice. And we are the ones to blame. It's not enough to tweet about indignities or, indignities or sign an online petition and go on about life as usual. We have to get up and get out to help and serve the people of God. Dr. King, in his last book entitled, Where Do We Go From Here?, said the great majority of Americans are suspended between these opposing attitudes. They are uneasy with injustice, but unwilling yet to pay a significant price to eradicate it. He also said, freedom is not won by a passive acceptance of suffering. Freedom is won by a struggle against suffering. Dr. King's words ring true today. We serve a God of action, not a God of inaction and fear. Are you a spectator Christian? As I close, I want to leave you with a story from author Jamar Tisby. It is a powerful story of how one ordinary person decided that he was no longer going to be a spectator Christian. In the face of horrible atrocity and injustice, you and I must rise up and affect change to make this wretched world more Christ-like. Four young girls busily prepared for their big day. It was September 15th, 1963 the day of the Youth Day Sunday service at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And the girls, along with the other young people of the congregation, would spend the next few hours singing songs, reciting poems, praying, and giving uh, encouraging messages in front of hundreds of beaming parents. The girls, Addie Mae Collins, age 14, Denise McNair, age 11, Carol Robertson, age 14, and Cynthia Wesley, age 14, had just finished Sunday school and were in the church basement making final adjustments to their white dresses when the bomb exploded. The blast, which killed all four girls and injured at least 20 others, left a hole in the floor five feet wide and two feet deep. It decapitated Cynthia. Her parents could only identify her body by her feet and by the ring she was wearing. A newspaper report at the time indicated that all of the church's stained glass windows had been destroyed except one. The window depicted Christ leading a group of little children the face of Christ was blown out. Three days later, an integrated crowd of thousands of mourners gather at Sixth Avenue Baptist Church for a funeral for three of the four girls. So many attended that the mass of people spilled out of the sanctuary and into the street. Before the funeral, on the day after the bombing, a young white lawyer named Charles Morgan Jr delivered a lunchtime speech at Birmingham's All-White Young Men's Business Association, or club, rather. Of course, he had heard about the tragedy in his city, and this lifelong Southerner jotted down some words about racism and complicity that would prove to be a turning point in his life. 
Reflecting on the events, he said, who did it? Who threw that bomb? Was it a Negro or a white? The answer should be, we all did it. Every last one of us is condemned for that crime and the bombing before it and a decade ago. We all did it. Morgan also recognized that Christians bore as much responsibility as anyone for the state of race relations in the city. He spoke, it is all the Christians and all their ministers who spoke too late in anguished cries against violence. Some white Birmingham residents did not receive Charles Morgan Jr.'s speech well. Though many hurled death threats at Morgan personally, the threat that most disturbed him listed every place his wife and son had been on a recent Saturday. Morgan soon closed his law practice and moved elsewhere to engage in a long career of civil rights law. Morgan had had enough. He had been a spectator Christian for too long. And he is a great example, as is Dr. King, for all of us to follow. In closing, there are many aspects to the beautiful legacy of Dr. King, but these four are the most important, I think. First, we must live and serve like Christ. Second, we must fight for economic justice. Third, we must fight to free our people and finally, we must take action now. We, the stewards of this legacy, must guard it from those who want to diminish, tarnish, and even extinguish it. You and I keep it alive, not only honoring it, but also living it. And it starts today. Thank you. The word this morning.